Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Blue Ribbon Lounge podcast. Welcome to the lounge. Or BLRP if, you, Blurp. if, you, if you're weird. <laughs> BLRP, yeah. I actually had that written down on a piece of newspaper, and my old lady was like, what's BLRP? I'm like... Blue Ribbon Lounge podcast. <laughs> it, it makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, once you say it. Yeah. Uh, and on that note, we got uh, some new merch kind of in the works. Yeah, you might have seen it on the uh, Facebook page. Yeah, the new Facebook page out there. Uh, check it out. Just Google Blue Ribbon Lounge podcast. Or not Google. Uh, search. Search in Facebook. Yeah. That place. Yeah, feel free to join. We're yeah. always sharing memes and the dankest memes sure <laughs> uh but yeah uh so dave had some pretty good ideas and then i uh i just had the equipment to be able to whip them up so the artistry yeah i think they turned out good what do you think dave yeah they look great yeah i think so too uh so today i just got back yeah from uh las vegas fabulous las vegas so my out and about is uh not really in town in the in the fabulous quad city area no you went to viva las vegas viva las vegas rockabilly weekender for a big car show and it's like 24 7 music uh and bands play like every couple of hours and stuff like that okay uh it was a really good time i got tattooed oh they had a room full of tattoo artists and stuff there that was pretty fun i did see that was that um dr seuss yeah what and you know what ish Uh, yeah ish yeah it was uh dr seuss has like a line of books but this was a different author Uh, oh okay yeah the uh the book is put me in the zoo and uh i just saw this cool like vintage panther type flash where it's like looks like it's crawling down your skin and uh i had him throw some of the spots off the dog from that book and i think it turned out really good oh yeah it looks really good yeah i was really happy so the the trip was insane we drove for three days and then i got to viva for three days and drove three days back uh, the car held out until the second to last day. Oh, really? And then the uh, alternator went out. Ooh. So we had a tow, had to get it fixed. Got fixed in in, in like three hours, though, once oh, they opened up. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah, it was really nice. Uh, and then we stopped at a bunch of great places. The car show, which we were planning on vending for fabulous Abernathy's. Yes. Uh, check out Abernathy's. They are good people. Um, but the wind in vegas hit like spurts of 50 miles an hour damn so we had racks of clothes which turned into sales oh man and uh and then we got shut down kind of early so we didn't make as much as we wanted to but it was still we just still did pretty good people were really glad that we were there my wife really tries to stick uh the good clothes into a good price range because sometimes that stuff can get over the top, but we're we're in night or we're in twenty twenty two, and so people are always like, "Do you have any vintage nineteen twenties outfits?" Oh. It's like, no, that shit is a hundred years old. Yeah, it's just turned into dust at this point. And if we had it, it would be so expensive. No flapper girl stuff. Yeah, well, nothing old. They do uh, a lot of like retro type stuff now. Yeah, which is really nice. It, it it's better, maybe not better made, but it's better made than something a hundred years ago you know what i mean like after 100 years you get holes and stains from it living yeah and i could see uh if it's not kept like zipped up with mothballs it's gonna be rough or if you do have something that's pristine it's probably expensive yeah exactly uh so there were a lot of hiccups on that trip and uh we figured it out and we got there and back safe and we were happy with that that's cool I also went on a trip. Oh, really? Uh, to North Carolina. Oh. since the last time we podcasted. Oh, that's right. You left. Uh, I think a couple of days before me. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the only well, we had a couple of hiccups. It like rained the whole way out, Ew. and then when we hit West Virginia, going down the Appalachians. Appalachians yes, yeah. for some reason I was like the Andes. Like that's not right. <laughs> um, it snowed like white. Whoa. Out. Yeah, because I I think I cursed myself. Because I turn on the radio, and it's like rain, and then it's like, oh, slow, and then snow swells up to blinding conditions and can cover an area in a matter of seconds. And I'm like, oh, it's a good thing we're driving out of that. No sooner I turn the radio off, 
blizzard blinding like couldn't had to slow down to like 35 wow and like had to look for the line on the side of the highway or the interstate yeah and you're driving your little car yeah my little hybrid (laughs) but i mean we just kept putzing along and finally pulled out of it got down the mountain far enough and yeah and some stuff like that man once you get stuck if you stop or wait too long you know you could get stuck in a worse situation yeah because i mean it was literally like blinding and like had to put my hazards on and it had yeah that white line and that was even like starting to fade because all the snow that just was drifting yeah well we're glad you made it back safe Dave. oh yeah the drive back was easy well i'm glad you made it there then <laughs> uh was there anything going on in town how was the weather while i was out of town uh just rainy hell yeah yeah, and it's supposed to be rainy again tonight. And... I was I was totally expecting as soon as we left for it to be, uh, you know, 70 and sunny, like the uh, day we left for Las Vegas. Um, No, it just rained the whole yeah. time. Oh, that's all right. Yeah, it's April showers. Yeah, May flowers, baby. Right? Get some color into this world. I just wish I knew when I could plant something without a frost. Yeah. I'm so bad about plants and stuff like that. I've been wanting to grow some grass in my front yard for five years now and it's just like i'll throw it down and then it'll be sunny all the rest of the week yeah and it just burns up or it's raining forever and i take my time trying to plant it and then the rain stops and uh yeah i'm so bad with that kind of stuff yeah that's why i just do like tomatoes and green peppers Mm. and the easy stuff the hardy things i can grow a lot of dandelions (laughs) i think they make yards look nice until you get the white ones and then it's just like got those big stalks and the wind blows all the little fuzzies off of them and they're just like ugly looking yeah and i live in bettendorf over in iowa and our lawn is like an island because everybody else has like green and nice lawns (laughs) and we're just like dandelions and fluff puff balls that's funny yeah not a lot of curb appeal (laughs) that's all right so uh i did see on the facebook page there was a van you stuck a sticker on yeah was that an oola van oola van is that like the the not the brand no. but the the model no that would have been like a volkswagen yeah it was like a volkswagen bus or something or microbus or something yeah, whatever something it's like called that. uh no there's a thing uh one of my friends uh eric junker does and they had a van at one point and they went to go see it and it had a bunch of stickers and like stuff and i think it's supposed to be like a motivational thing and you go out and you like put your little mark on it for like uh i don't know i really don't know how it goes i'm just making it up right now (laughs) okay this van this van uh along with a bunch of other uh posts that i made on the the facebook page um we took interstate 40 maybe 43 i can't remember exactly off the top of my head but it is just the two lane highway that kind of runs along route 66. Oh, okay. And so we would, every once in a while we'd stop off and pop into route 66 and drive through a city and see all the neons and stuff like that. It was, it was a really great drive and all the cute little kitschy stops and towns and stuff like that. And that was one of them. And yeah, I've been meaning to head West one of these days, but all my family lives on the East coast. Yeah. So. Yeah, if we didn't have uh, this show to vent for Abernathy's, uh, it'd be a lot more difficult to get out west and, and do that kind of stuff. Right. So we pretty much just try to break even on gas and hotel rooms and stuff like that. and Just try to sell enough to <laughs> pay for our way back pretty much. Right. Yeah, yeah. we appreciate everybody that bought from us out there because we uh, may not have had the gas money. Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was super fun. Uh, I stopped at, we stopped at this teeny tiny little Chinese, uh, food place. Yeah. And, uh, I was talking to my wife and she doesn't listen to the podcast, which is maybe for her benefit because her having to hear my voice all the time is probably Yeah. Enough. Even when you're not there. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I was telling her all the information we had from the fortune telling episode, uh, episode 21, a good one yeah. about how, uh, Chinese restaurant fortune cookies are not actually Chinese. Are they Japanese? Yes, they but, were. They were originally Japanese, and they got a little Americanized. Yeah, for some reason, I think if you ever like on a trivia night, I think they always say San Francisco. Uh, well, it was originally Japanese. Yeah, and then and it was originally not called a fortune cookie. Oh, okay. Uh, and 
there were two towns in California that tried to, I don't know if they tried to claim the, that it was made there or what. I don't know how it turned into a lawsuit. Oh, really? But uh, eventually it got to the courts in San Francisco, I believe, did win. Okay. Uh, in that a Japanese family there had been kind of manufacturing them as a tourist uh, type experience for quite a while. All right. Uh, but for more information on that, check out episode 21 if you haven't. That's yeah, you'll one. get the lowdown. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, other than other than driving and, and stopping, that was pretty much it. Yeah, I mean, um, that's pretty much it for me, too. I mean, we did just have Easter, but yeah, um, that's kind of a low-key holiday. We just had, like, a big breakfast and uh, hit some eggs around the house for the kids. Oh, nice. That was always my favorite part, but... Uh, the past couple of years for Easter, we've been in Las Vegas. The show is uh, a yearly show, and it always happens on Easter weekend. Okay. Uh, so we're al- almost always on the road for this one. Okay. I did, however, when I was in North Carolina, um, run into a young lady, uh, Lucy. Okay. Who watches Attack on Titan. Okay. Um, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. But I asked her if she listened to the podcast, and she said, yeah. And I'm like, do you like it? And she's like, no. <laughs> And I'm like, why not? And she's Honesty. like, you don't talk enough about Attack on Titan. Oh, okay. Yeah. So do you know Attack on Titan? I have uh, seen in the thumbnail on the internet. Okay. Is it on Netflix? Uh, or is it Hulu? Uh, Hulu? Okay. That, it's what, I don't. It's but, a streaming service. Yes. yes. I don't watch it. Uh, okay. But I'm willing to learn and maybe it'll intrigue me. Are you into anime at all? I used to be really into anime. I used to watch a lot of like Cowboy Bebop and Trigun and the old classics like Dragon Ball Z. And oh, okay. Yeah, I guess I only do like the Studio Ghibli movies. Those movies are so good. Yeah. The Spirited Aways and the Howl's Moving Castle. Right. I've never gotten to like a series. Um, my kid read a lot of like Fairy Tale and uh, One One Piece. One Piece, okay. Yeah. But I guess Attack on Titans is about a town that's within these three walls. And as you get farther in, like, there's another wall, and then it's merchants, and then there's another wall, and then it's, like, all the rich people are in the middle. Okay. And, like, they made Titans to go attack this other place, like a war kind of thing. And then the other people, like, pieced out. And then, so they're like, oh, there's just Titans running around. So then they just built these walls. And then I guess like the Titans end up breaking in and then the people have to go to the next part. And then there's like these scouts. There's this guy named Levi, Leroy. Leroy Jenkins. Yeah. And he uses like this slingshot grapple hook thing to like slice them in the back of their neck to kill the Titans. Oh, okay. Yeah. So is is this a show about like the Titan killers? Kinda, but it's also kind of about like the whole like uh political aspect mm. behind like where the first Titans came from and how they made this serum and then this other place they're warring with and then uh spoilers. Maybe I shouldn't get into it. <laughs> well, uh let's maybe have a little attack on Titan bit next time too. I'll watch a couple of episodes maybe. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, because I tried to write like just watch like a an Attack on Titans in ten minutes kind of oh, video on YouTube, okay, okay. and there was just so much. I'm like, this wasn't even like what Lucy was telling me about. Oh, really? So there's like so much to it. That, did did it get you interested in the show? Um, a little bit, but kind of like uh, Game of Thrones. I'm not really mm. big on a lot of just talking. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I love Game of Thrones. Yeah, it was a very good series. I mean, the endings are never good, but. Uh, yeah. As far as it goes, it was it was a decent ending. Yeah. Well, that's uh, J.R.R. Martin's fault. Oh, why is that? Oh, is that the writer? Yeah. Is he dead now, or he? Just... No, he just hasn't finished the last two books. Yeah. So then the writers that were adapting his books to the show, yeah, they had to make it up the rest of it. Yeah. And they obviously weren't super great at just making stuff up yeah they were better at just adapting Mm -hmm. his stuff i mean they were good at like cutting out things and then like uh focusing on like important stuff to make like an average joe like get the you know interested in it but then when it came to just them like go for it i think they kind of dropped the ball a little bit yeah and i don't know uh what is kind of 
more the reason but this this era of new high fantasy blowing up between uh your um damn it what what were we just talking about game of thrones Uh, your game of thrones and your uh your dungeons and dragons fifth edition and uh all of these podcasts that are like live uh D games like critical role critical role and then they're going to be having a, a series on amazon amazon's also doing a lord of the rings oh, like, series yeah about the samarillion uh i guess i don't know too much about it but yeah it's all like prequel stuff mm. from the samarillion but the samarillion is a really dry book oh okay so I'm i have heard of the samarillion not really sure how that's gonna go well i mean i hey i don't knock it even if it's bad i'll probably watch it i haven't gotten into that witcher movie or tv show yeah i watched like an episode and i just couldn't get hooked yeah uh but all this uh this high fantasy blow up right now i do not hate it no and i think it's all uh peter jackson and the lord of the rings Mm. really kind of made it because now those people who grew up with that are maybe kind of getting older and able to create more things yeah and branching out and then being like oh this stuff's not just nerd stuff yeah 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 i mean it's all uh to me and my wife always gives me uh dogs on me for it i call everything like the hero's quest or like a, oh it's a dungeon and dragon story but it's like everything is really a hero's quest every story yeah. is essentially got the same uh, archetypes but uh right. but i love that kind of stuff um what's that one with the monkey king the monkey king it's a old old chinese story but it's like about the monkey king uh i think i know what you're talking about and i think there was a a movie and a tv show made on it and also maybe even an anime yeah and i think that is one of the original like hero journey Mm, stories okay and i if it's chinese i would probably imagine it's probably older than like uh the odyssey and stuff like that I think they, I think the Chinese culture kind of predates that. Yeah. Or at least parallel to it. Yeah. At at the very least, for sure. And I mean, I don't know what kind of uh, interconnections they had. Uh, I'm a huge fan of hardcore history, if you've ever heard of it. Uh, That's a YouTube or podcast? podcast. You might be able to find it on YouTube, but it's a, a guy named Dan Carlin. And he like just really dives into these stories. I just listened to one. It was called King of Kings, and it followed um, like a little bit of Caesar and a little bit of uh, Alex the Great and a little bit of Xerxes and and stuff like that. Uh, and about like a lot of the wars, like you would see, like the expanded realm of like three hundred, right? The movie. Um, but it was the way he does stuff is just so good, and he puts out these like three to six hour episodes. And they're never one episode. They're always like, I think the shortest one he has is three, four hour episodes on a series. And and the longest one he has is on um, World War One, which is like six, six hour episodes. But the first of all, buttery tones in that man's voice. He's I could listen to him talk all damn day. He's got that smooth voice. Yeah. But uh, the the way he tells these stories is it's just like a regular guy talking about it. You know, it's not these dry uh, history channel documentaries. Right. He doesn't get into like super into how the formations were formed and the, he, he does a little bit, but, and he goes everywhere from like zoom in, zoomed into like uh, soldiers experiences and letters they write. And then he zooms all the way out to like uh, inventions of new equipment and like how, uh formations would have like a, an anvil hammer and anvil type thing where you'd sweep around with your cavalry and some of your heavier stuff while you have a lot of forces down below so that they kind of crash and flank each other uh right. it, it's really good and so hardcore history and then hardcore history addendum is where you would find shorter episodes and that's where he goes back and just like what like well it adds it's, to it's, the bigger one kinda. it's called addendum but it's mostly just like shorter snippets of stories. Okay. Uh, so like he just did an addendum. He he did an addendum about World War One, I, I think, with Elon Musk, where they just talk about um, some of the technology. But then I'll also have sh- just shorter one to three hour single episode stories. So that's a little bit easier to dip your toes into. Okay. 
Yeah, I like a guy, uh, Lindy Beige. Lindy Beige. Yeah, he's a YouTuber. Okay. And he does a lot of, like, medieval stuff mm -hmm. and, like, um, I guess Roman things because he talks a lot about Hannibal and how okay. he crossed the Alps with the elephants. Mm, yeah. And, like, what kind of formations, like, the, like, the Greeks and the Romans would use. And then talk about, like, uh, different platoons, I guess. And it's he's all does it really interesting. Oh, yeah. He also sure. talks about, like, uh, blacksmithing and knights and how armor actually worked. And he's got a good, like, uh, British accent. Ooh, nice. Yeah, so it makes it seem a little more official. He also likes to talk about tanks and stuff, too. Oh, okay. So there's a little bit of everything. So at Viva, and, and you might like this band too maybe a little bit but uh they're they're surf rock um so i just wanted to give a shout out to this uh band the televisionaries um you should look up their song mad about you mad about you yeah i think it's their most popular song uh easy to find the, the televisionaries i keep saying the wrong name okay i think i've heard one or two of their songs okay they're, it, it's like three young brothers and their friend and they're like all like 20 years old and they're playing these big shows in vegas now but uh but it was really good and really fun to listen to so i wanted to make sure i gave a shout out to okay that. no that's cool do they talk about like paul reisner and uh <laughs> yeah, helen right. hunt <laughs> uh what the guy who introduced him uh had made a joke about paul reiser uh and i thought it was pretty funny i think i was the only one that got it there but <laughs> <laughs> yeah right on yeah so that was uh interesting couple of weeks for us for sure yeah for sure so we'll get into uh the meat and potatoes here yeah, and I'm um, just going to do a little something different because uh, we wanted to dedicate this to uh, Gage Stubbs, who is my nephew. Okay. And um, uh, he played D&D &D a little bit, and then he... Did you have a hand in that, Dave? Oh, well, when he came to stay for a month in the summer, like a couple years ago, Yeah, I made him and my kid play like at least four games of Ravenloft. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking Curse of Strahd. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's in the Ravenloft area. And then I think that really, like, got him interested in it because then he went home and he helped start a D and d club for his high school. Oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, and I think even after he graduated, they still kept it going. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he got, like, uh, one of his teachers to come in and be the DM for him. Oh, cool. Yeah. So uh, I think he would really like our topic for today. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But uh, sadly, he got into a car crash a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, Sorry to hear about that, Dave. Yeah, that's all right. So I just like to take a moment and maybe uh, raise a glass here. Or if you're listening at home and you want to flick a bick. Yeah, uh, I think uh, remembering people like committing to like an act of remembrance is pretty powerful or forget you know there's a lot of things uh that people try to forget um in their life but i think the memory is maybe a little bit more important and, yes and just having that act that symbol is always a good thing for sure yeah so to gauge the gauge oh, smooth <laughs> it's a little rough yeah so uh today we're talking about D and D, D Dungeons and Dragons, the Devil's Game. Yes, the occult uh, phenomenon that swept the nation. And I'm going to put a drop in here uh, for that eight bit D and D. Okay, I'm going to put it in here, and maybe one at the end. I don't know. All right. Now, Dungeons and Dragons, Satan's game. Your children, like it or not, are attracted in their weaker years to the occult. And a game like D&D &D fuels their imagination and makes them feel special while drawing them deeper and deeper into the bowels of El Diablo. And then we'll go. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, but yeah, if you don't know, D&D uh, &D was a game created in 1974 by Gary Gygax and Dave Arnold. Do you know how to say that? No. Okay. How do you spell it? Uh, art in. Let me see if I gotta look at my chicken scratch here. Um, it's R N L S O N Arnolson Arnolson Arnolson. That sounds right. Yeah. Um, and he was actually um, it was kind of 
Dave Arnoldson's I wouldn't call it his baby, but he made this game called Blackmore that uh cuz those guys were in like a gaming club or mm-hmm. like a war game club. Yeah, cuz before Dungeons and Dragons, it was all about like buying soldiers and creating armies. Yeah, like with miniatures and mm-hmm. like the whole big like we're going to reenact Waterloo and Yeah, a lot of it was like almost reenacting actual battles and stuff. Right. And the uh I've seen like videos on it and I've read a little bit about it and it was the rules are super convoluted and strict and like you mean for like the uh the war games. The war gaming, yeah. yeah. And uh uh and like don't you have to like measure everything out and stuff? Yeah, because you can only move so far and if you want to like shoot your musket, you have to be exactly this far mm-hmm. away and it's a lot like Warhammer. 40K. Yeah. 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 Uh Warhammer is obviously just uh a little bit more sci-fi. Right. I mean, you have to have all the armies and minis mm-hmm. and this color <laughs> army does this kind of thing and this one does that and it's kind of crazy. But then uh, Dave showed up with this Blackmore um game where he incorporated like fantasy into it, mm-hmm. like dragons and orcs and elves. And then he also like um liked the idea of like your you had a character and they like leveled up. Mm-hmm. And so he kinda had like a rough outline. And after playing it, uh Gygax was like, Oh, I like this. So then he asked Dave for his uh like instruction manual or his rules, I guess, and just like sat down and over like two weeks just busted out and like D and D pretty much. Yeah, which uh, the idea... I've never played a war game. I don't know if you have. No. Outside of Risk or Stratego. Right. Yeah. Um, but what I do really like about Dungeons & Dragons is that you have a character that you have to look out for. Yeah. You know, in a... And I don't I don't know anything about actual life generals and stuff, but, uh, but you know, looking at a map and having arguably you know, thousands of troops to be able to throw around how you please. You know, when you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, you only have 10, 20 hit points. Yeah. You and know, you're and just looking out for yourself. Yeah. You, you got to be careful. You have to actually be careful about what you do. Cause it could end a portion of the game for you. Right. You could, uh, die. Yeah. Cause you only have so many hit points. Yeah. And I, I say a portion of the game and we'll get into maybe that later because, what you'll find in a lot of the stuff that we're about to talk about is um, people going a little bit crazy about dying, and in real life, it's just you roll another character. Yeah, a little D and D trivia: the first two people that ever played tested D and D, yeah, were uh, Gygax's eleven-year-old um, son Ernie and his nine-year-old daughter Elsie. Oh, okay, yeah, that's cool. And it was he made a castle Greyhawk. And he just did like a one level dungeon, mm-hmm. and then after dinner one night, they rolled up characters and played until it was time for the DM to put them to bed. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I think I think my kid was about nine when we started playing Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, my kid. I think she was about eleven. Okay. Yeah, because she came home from school one day, and she was like, "I'm not really good at uh, making up stories or like writing," and I'm like. Oh, that's all imagination. Oh, you know what's good for that? <laughs> yeah. And so I went out and bought the fifth edition starter set. Okay. Yeah. It's been out that long? Yeah. Dang. That's crazy. It is crazy. Well, I guess your kid being 11 is probably pretty close to my kid being nine. When it first started, uh, Gygax started grabbing people from their war games club. Yeah. And um, they would like sit at a table across the room. And he would sit at his desk and he would pull out, he had like a filing cabinet and he would pull out the drawers so they couldn't see him. Okay. And uh, it was all completely in their head. Oh, wow. Yeah. And if they wanted a map or anything, they'd have to draw it themselves. Yeah. And uh, which is not, I don't think inherently bad. No. I think it's just a little bit more work than is one necessary and two, um, what a lot of what I would call normies would want to do. Right. And it would be a lot of like asking questions like, okay, well, how far is the wall across from me? Oh, it's probably five feet. So then you have to draw and then like to the right, what do I see? Like, you know? Yeah. 
Because if you're just like, the hallway goes to the left and the hallway goes to the right, like... Yeah, I imagine playing Dungeons & Dragons with, like, a cartographer. Oh. Is that the study of maps? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that'd be crazy. Because it didn't, until later uh, editions, did they start incorporating minis and maps mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Yeah. Which, uh, I've never been a huge fan of minis. I do like them in, that a, in a sense that you, like can more easily visualize what your character looks like. Right. Uh, when you have, like, you buy a, a knight in silver armor, and then you just kind of can fancy it up in your head a little bit more. Right. I always like them for uh, the battles. Mm, yeah. Fighting with minis is, is pretty nice. Yeah, because then you can kind of see where everybody is on the battlefield. Yeah. Because otherwise, uh, you get a lot into, like, if you're fighting in a narrow hallway, oh yeah, and you have five heroes and two bad guys, but somehow all five heroes can attack the bad guys, yeah. like that wouldn't happen. Yeah. So it was um kind of for like the first five years, just uh, word of mouth, like a lot of college kids and mm -hmm. uh, younger, uh, I don't know, nerds, I guess. <laughs> Not, but like people, they would go to like game stores and maybe collect cards or something and then they would hear about this game and then they'd buy it and play it with their friends and yeah because it was a really like groundbreaking game yeah because a lot of people were actually playing like that like the war game or like some strategio or something and then their friend would be like oh you know what you know what's really fun this game i call her D, D. like instead of fighting uh the red coats you like fight dragons and vampires yeah yeah and i think that kind of stuff just gets because you're using more of your imagination when you're thinking about like a war you have to see what it was already like right and and i like how wherever you go even within fantasy dragons look a little bit different yeah or uh you know wizards and sorceries look a little bit different uh yeah because like um there's dragon heart uh sean connery that dragon yeah, yeah but then uh lord of the rings those wraith ring wraith dragons yeah don't quite look they kind of have a square head yeah and they're like got a long neck yeah and they look not kind of like more like bats or something i don't yeah. know well i like uh dragons the the way i think most people see them is like a lizard with wings right but i like the dragons that have like legs yeah. but then they're their wings are like also kind of their arms oh okay that's like kind of my what i like to see in dragons not the four-legged ones i i mean those are okay but uh i think it's just like maybe a little bit more um different in a natural way right like um like you a dragon i think would be closer to a bat than right than like a, a lizard yeah and then there's also like the japanese or like the a luck dragon yeah yeah those are pretty cool yeah was that fal falco falcor i'm not sure oh <laughs> never ending story oh <laughs> yeah i when i think of it i think of uh the dragon off of dragon ball z oh okay <laughs> like that's kind of a crazy one or mushu mushu yeah <laughs> yeah he's a good one yeah uh these role-playing games in the late well it started like in the 80s like uh 1979 kind of got a bad connotation yeah but um there was a build-up in the country at that time because like um the counterculture revolution just ended pretty much yeah and um moms uh with uh the rise of uh like women's lib and mm -hmm. also like the economy like m women were going to work yeah more so then kids were kind of left to their own devices a little bit more. Yeah. And so um, a lot of, and also like TVs became more prevalent in the household mm -hmm. and uh, the cable, like, like cable companies started to become a thing. So you didn't just have the three main channels. You had like a wide variety of stuff to watch. Yeah. People could, anybody could start putting stuff out on TV. Yeah. And um, like after, once, uh, Mom started leaving their kids kind of like that was the latchkey generation. Yeah, for sure. And so then uh, some moms got super like uh, protective mm -hmm. and um, 
right around this time, like the PMRC, I think, was starting to form. PMRC. Which is like the Parental Control, Parental Something Music Review. Okay. Like the people that... Like uh, the people that put uh, mature content around yeah, their they, stickers. Yeah, they championed that whole thing. And there was also <laughs> like, uh, mom started speaking out against horror movies because they became more like bloody Graphic, and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, is that about the time when like... Uh... The original slasher film started coming out. Yeah, because uh, Texas Texas Chainsaw Massacre was seventy four, and then I think shortly after that was like uh, Halloween. Yeah. So like the slasher films were starting to become more yeah. prevalent. And you got all the all the metal music that started coming out. Rock and roll really took a a heavy turn into yeah branching off into metal. Right, and acid rock, and all the rock stars with their tight pants and their <laughs> devil worship. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, they really adapted a lot of, like, pentagrams and stuff like that. And yeah. Symbols that uh, were, they were adapted to break away from the mainstream. Right, because they were getting away from kind of the, the hippie rock and yeah. the bubblegum pop. Mm-hmm. And then being like, well, okay, uh, electric guitars and Ooh, synthesizers yeah. and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and like fast and hard right uh and just like really breaking through what people thought music was yeah and uh, when uh you know they think elvis was bad like mick jagger shows up and starts swinging around or like um led zeppelin where the guy would wear the tight leather pants on stage yeah or uh what's that twisted sister oh yeah wearing makeup with huge hair on stage right so um it was all, it started with like the Carter administration, but also Reagan administration. Mm-hmm. Uh, they really started to pump up the like Christian right. Yeah. And like uh, the war on drugs and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, politicians were also starting to like act or like say they were more moral mm. because I think like Carter and like I said, Reagan really used that uh, untapped uh, voter pool of yeah really conservative christians who after the shock of the hippies and all that they're like oh we we're with family values we're all about yeah. that so um it kind of started so there was kind of like a they called it a moral panic kind yeah. of going on yeah and um and then uh james dallas egbert the third yes it came into the news did you hear about that yeah uh so he was like 16 years old and he had went to college yeah um michigan state michigan state uh and he went missing at one point yeah uh and so his parents hired a detective what was it like john deere or something like that Maybe. John deere. <laughs> it was uh, something deer yeah it's william deere. Will, william deere yeah old billy deere right uh john's younger brother um and he it was spelled different though, D E A R, yeah. I think. Uh, and so he went missing. His parents hired Deer, and he went into uh, Egbert's bedroom and yeah. saw like the D and D books that had you know monsters on them. Right. And uh, he immediately said that that was a a reason for it. Yeah. Well, they also said that they were um, like LARPing in the steam tunnels yeah like live action role play and i didn't i didn't hear anything first of all larping is for lame oh. I, I think that's like the nerdiest D you can get really where you go out there and hit each other with the <laughs> yeah foam sticks uh but anyways uh i didn't hear anything that that was true yeah i heard I, it, I thought it was maybe just a lot of speculation um they said that the the steam tunnels were used for live action role playing, but I never, I only kind of like it was in the Wikipedia and then this other article kind of touched on it, but yeah, it was, it was seemed like a lot of quick passing because they didn't find him in there at all. No. And it was kind of like speculation because he saw, um, like thumbtacks on a board that were set up. It looked random to me, but when you overlaid it with the map of the steam tunnels, it looked like, points in the steam tunnel okay because i had heard that too um but the visual i saw maybe didn't look quite that convincing to me 
Right. That's what I thought too. But um, I guess like maybe it, I also heard that he might have run away to the steam tunnels and then later left like before this investigator oh, came okay. up. But um, once they were looking for him in the steam tunnels and they were talking about this D and D and then the live action stuff, the media kind of snagged onto it and mm-hmm. ran with it. Yeah. And then that w- with, uh, you know, TVs just becoming prevalent in people's homes. That's how people were getting their information, their news. Right. And uh, so they were taking like everything on there as gospel. Right. And it was also, like I said, the cable started happening. So it was actually um, kind of the birth of like an echo chamber. Oh, yeah. Where if you didn't like what CBS was saying to you, you could switch it over to Fox or yeah. like uh, Channel 18 and see what their news is saying, like to get kind of what you wanted to hear. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if your kid is uh, playing Dungeons and Dragons and you don't like it, then right. you try to find where... Or, or your kid's doing bad in school and he just happens to be playing Dungeons and Dragons. Well, now I have something, a reason to get him to stop this to do better in school. Right. James ended up uh, killing himself. Yeah. It, I heard he had tried and on his third attempt, he did succeed. Yeah, but he was troubled. It said um, he was kind of struggling uh, with depression, parental par- or pressure, and drug addiction. And he did attempted suicide before all this happened. Mm-hmm. Plus the pressure of being a 16-year-old kid in college. I couldn't imagine you feel like you fit in very much. Yeah. And, I mean, anybody that plays Dungeons & Dragons is a nerd. And nerds are known to get, you know, made fun of. And I, I guess I don't know what it was like in the 80s. Right. It definitely was more of a fringe thing. Y- yeah, probably even more of a fringe thing now. Yeah, than it is than now. now. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, Wizards of the Coast really kind of bumped up D and D to yeah. a more acceptable level. Mm-hmm. Cause before, yeah, like, well, and you got your video games. Like I know plenty of people who love sports and yeah. were jocks in school, but they played halo or, uh, you know, this assassin's creed is a pretty popular game for, for people like that. Yeah. And then you even got sports games, right? You're nice. mad in and everything. Yeah. You got your, you're creating links to, to people like, oh, we both play video games. You play, you know, you're done your fantasy video games. I play sports video games, but it's still kind of like a connecting link. About two years later, uh, a lady put out the book Mazes and Monsters, which was a fictionalized version of what happened to James. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think just a couple of years after that, uh, the movie, a uh, made for TV movie with Tom Hanks came out. Yeah, 1982, I think. Yeah. And, uh, that was also a big thing because it's like this guy was playing D and he uh, got disassociated with reality. Yeah, had some sort of psychotic break. Yeah, this was before information was super like at your fingertips. Yeah, and uh, you know they may not have known a lot about mental disease and yeah. things like that. They definitely, I don't think, knew about depression. For sure. And, and how it was, it's an actual chemical imbalance. Yeah. Uh, so when they they thought when kids got depressed, they just need to, you know, walk it off or... Get into or, sports. Yeah, or... figure it out. Right. Uh, and we can see now that, um, like, in that movie, uh, Mazes and Monsters, on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, if I remember, I'll try to link it below. Yeah, it's a, like an hour and a half. It's not too bad. Yeah. And, and it, if you go into it knowing that it was... I mean, probably a low budget movie in the eighties. Right. It's it's not an it's not an adventures movie. Right. But uh, I didn't think it was too bad. I actually really liked it. Yeah. Uh, outside of the way it made Dungeons and Dragons look bad. Yeah, and I think I want to say when I was in junior high and started playing it, it might have came on TV, and my mom was like, "Hey, watch this." Yeah. Like. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, be careful so you don't get too immersed in it. Right. Uh, or or you have the uh, the chick tracks. Oh yeah. Uh, what is it called? Dark Dungeon. Yeah. Uh, and I think that was actually made into a movie uh, in 2014, which yeah. is pretty new. That one, um, the chick track is crazy to read. Yeah. But any of those little chick track, they're like little uh, Christian books about like drinking, drinking, or, gambling or homosexuality. Yeah. Or, yeah. And then Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And I 
so when I found out they had a chick track, uh, and I think, I don't know if you had maybe said, or maybe I heard it on, uh, what some of my research, but you can look them all up on the internet and, yeah. and you can read them and they're, well, one are the art is great. Yeah. Uh, and two, they're pretty funny because now that we know a little bit about these things, but if you were to give that to somebody who didn't know anything, yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it, the, in, in a nutshell, it talks about a couple of people playing Dungeons and Dragons and one girl dies yeah. in the game. Right. And so she thinks her life is over and she kills herself. Right. She's and then, so distraught. Yeah. And uh, the other friend succeeds in the game and gets accepted into a, an occult. Or she, yeah, they're like, you want to join the occult? That was just a test. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't have a name. It was just called the occult. I yeah. Think. <laughs> like you want to learn real witchcraft now? Yeah. And uh, it's just so far out there. I don't and you have to buy those. If you see those in a store, those people bought those. Oh, really? Yeah. I thought they were just kind of like the Gideon Bible where people were just, you would leave them around. Yeah, that's what I would For people to pick up. Uh, or maybe churches pay for them and kind of distribute them amongst their groups. And, yeah, and then those people, those, yeah, those people put them in their stores and stuff. But uh, that chick guy is making a ton of money on them. Well, especially now that they're kind of, people take them as tongue in cheek because that yeah. movie that they made about dark dungeons uh someone bought the rights for it mm. and they made it like super cheesy because it's like the two girls are in college and then these people come walking through and it's all slow-mo and they're in like dark leather and they're like who's that and they're like those are the D and D players and they're yeah. like oh the D and D kids are like the the sports yeah jacks, the, the cool, cool kids, kids. Yeah. yeah that's funny did you hear anything about this uh Irving Pulling? Uh, yes. Bick? Bink? Bink? Yes. Uh, he was a 16-year-old kid, and in 1982, he committed suicide uh, with a pistol, killed him, shot himself. Um, his mom, Miss Pulling, said that her son killed himself hours after a curse was placed on him during a and d game at his high school. Yeah, and... She actually sued the principal or tried to sue the principal. The the principal, two teachers, and I think uh, TSR. Yeah, because she said that the curse that the principal put on his character in the game was real and then caused him to kill himself because of the curse started out with, your soul belongs to me and s some other stuff. But And she tried to sue... Uh, Everybody, and including TSR, for like $10 million. Yeah. And uh, it ended up just getting thrown out in court. Right. Uh, but she ended up uh, creating bad. Yes. Bothered about D&D. &D, <laughs> yeah. Which is, now it's kind of laughable. But I also think, like, mad was already taken. Yeah. So she couldn't be, like, mother against D&D. &D. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's so crazy in that time how many, like, people were just grouping up. Yeah. Um, well, it kind of was at a time, like I said, the culture was changing. Because that would have been during D.A.R.E. Yeah. There's acronyms everywhere. Right. And it was kind of like um, they were looking for something to blame besides themselves. Yeah. Is what it seemed like. Well, and, and maybe they didn't. I would imagine they didn't realize it. And as a father, I couldn't imagine if my kill, my kid killed himself. Um, in that you would have to find something to blame, I think. Yeah, I mean... Well, maybe not. Because, I mean, I'm a pretty rational human being. Yeah, and, and but in, like, a conservative Christian family where you feel like you don't fit in and your mom is overbearing and mm -hmm. being like, oh, no, you're fine, and he's doing so... Look, your little... Uh, Irving. Look, look at little Irving. He's doing so great. Aren't you, honey? You're so great. Okay. And then just like totally ignoring your kid. Yeah. And like, obviously she didn't know what he was into. And like, it was kind of the same argument that like Frank Zappa made about the PMRC and like, uh, lab like putting warning labels on music. Mm, yeah. Is like, it's kind of the parent's responsibility. I would think to so. To some extent. Like, because... I get it. Uh, you're not at home. You work. 
but you should still be like, what are my kids listening to? Or if your kid runs up to you with a CD and it's like iced tea and he's like got a grill and like an AK, you could probably be like, no, even if it doesn't <laughs> yeah. have a label on it, you can yeah. kind of be like, I don't think this is appropriate for you. Yeah. A, a lot of just like relaxed, maybe not relaxed parenting, but like a little bit of a pass of a buck. Yeah. Because, you know, their generation probably their parents worked and their mom was at home. So yeah. the mom kind of knew what was going on with the kids. And then the dad, you know, the nuclear family yeah. portrayed on TV usually probably didn't care that much. Yeah. Or he would just come in with a pipe and be like, well, let me mansplain this to you, Tommy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Miss uh, Miss Polling, she ended up getting her private investigator's license. Yeah. And she became a quote unquote expert in game related lawsuits yeah um and there was a guy i didn't write it down but he wrote the pulling report mm. where he went back and kind of dissected her whole argument okay and part of it was she said she got this um investigation license six years or she had six years of experience and he was like that doesn't match up and or she said seven years, and he's like, even if she had six years, that would have been like three months before her kid did that. Yeah. So if she was already investigating what D&D &D was before that, she could have, you know, talked to your kid. Yeah. Because that was a big defense by, like, uh, Gygax and their PR person was to be like, hey, kids, talk to your parents. Get them to come down and play a game with you, and they'll see how, how harmless it is. Yeah, and uh, so Gary Gygax, there was a lot of on TV at this point. Yeah, because like I was saying, the cable was getting more popular. Yeah, and uh, talk shows and things like that. Yeah. And like the 60-minute report type deals. Yeah, and Donahue. Yeah, and uh, Gary Gygax was invited onto a show to talk about D&D. &D. It seemed like they had told him they were going to talk about Dungeons & Dragons. Right. Which was the truth. But when he got on there, he was kind of attacked with all these uh, why is your satanic game killing all these kids type things. Right. And he, when he was asked, uh, it, if you found 12 cases of kids uh, in murder suicides uh, with one, one connecting factor, wouldn't you look into it? And his response was... Uh, yes, but I would do it in a scientific manner. This is nothing but a witch hunt. Right. And the guy did go on to say, the interviewer was like, if you know that your game's hurting people, like, wouldn't you want to censor it or put a label on it or something? And he's like, it's a game and it's imagination and imagination can't hurt you any more than uh, getting bankrupt in Monopoly doesn't mean that you're bankrupt in real life. Exactly. And he was like, this chair... Can somebody can pick this chair up and hit you with it? Does that mean we should put a a sticker on this chair that says this chair can be used as a weapon? Yeah, use... a warning possible weapon. Right. Uh yeah. And I was I was thinking of how many times have there been, there been murder suicides or attacks in in the name of God? Right. And also uh, by Christian people or people who probably say they're a Christian because that at one point in time that was just everybody is a religion. Right. Uh, they didn't really have agnostics and stuff uh, at some point, but nobody connected those dots. Yeah. And they didn't also connect the dots where it's like, okay, at that time, 3 million people or kids were playing D and D. They only have 12. Yeah. Well then what's the percentage or average of kids in the whole country that commit it and then see if the percentage overlaps. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, I'd never seen any report connect that dot. Yeah, it seemed like all just, she put a spell on me, she's a witch. Yeah, and um, I kind of think it was also maybe a little bit of shitty police work. Yeah. Because a lot of them, when they're in the paper, or they're talking about, like, uh, this guy killed himself, and he had D&D &D books, and these two people murder suicide and their connecting thing was D D. It reminded me of the West Memphis three. Yeah. Where they're just like these heavy metal rock and roll kids, they had they must have did it. Yeah, they're wearing 
black shirts. And... Yeah, they're the only weirdos in our town. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of that could have been just built railroad or just cops, like, closing the case. I yeah, mean... I mean, uh, it seemed like... For a long time, police were just railroading to close cases yeah. or to put people away. Yeah. Well, especially something like uh, suicide. There's no one to catch. There's no criminal yeah. to catch. So yeah. then you just kind of like... You have to find a reason, even if that reason is actually in a person's brain. Right. You know, and you can't get to that anymore. Yeah, because a lot of times they would talk to their peers and they'd be like, oh, yeah, that guy was kind of an outcast. He didn't really fit in. Like, even in the case of um, Binks uh, pulling, his people said he had a lot more problems outside of D&D, like besides yeah. D&D. And his mom just, I get, it seemed like she didn't see it. Yeah. And at that time, that's what, have, what would have attracted you to things that are different. Right, because you don't fit in, and you find a little group that's willing to take you in and, you know, be friends. Yeah, yeah. if you're, one, if you're not good at sports, um, or you don't like them, but also even if you do, and the people within that group dog on you all the time, right. you're not going to want to continue that. You, and you need, you, sh you should be able to find a place to be more comfortable. Right, a place you fit in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if you had heard of this uh, Dr. Thomas Radecki. Uh, yeah. I liked some of his quotes where he was he was a psycholo psychologist from Illinois University, I think. Yeah. And uh, one of his quotes was, parents actually saw their teenage boy summon Dungeons and Dragons demons into his room before he killed himself. Yeah, I heard that one. And I'm <laughs> like, uh, no, I don't know how they would see that. Yeah. Like, or he was also saying, like, uh, some kid with um, astral projection set it set up a circle just like in the D and D books before putting a bullet in his head. Yeah, which is funny, and and I have never read. I would love to read the old books, but uh, I have never read anything in a D and D book that tells you what to do. No, it's a. And what I love about Dungeons and Dragons is it leaves it so open ended to where you can describe. Uh, how it works yeah because it'll be like a, a fireball a fireball this much space and this much damage and then it also says like oh you might need a hand movement and a piece of rose petal yeah it doesn't tell you like mix them together like this and then say these words yeah it's nothing like that and arguably again maybe it was different when the rules were a little bit different i have never played where i was like oh Dungeon Master, I'd like to find uh, dandelions and uh, wolf's bane so that I can do this spell. It's like, can I find the components? I'm going to cast a spell. Right. <laughs> Usually you just cast the spell. I mean, unless you're like super strict rule, yeah. rule lawyer or yeah. something. It's obvious that these people didn't know anything about Dungeons and Dragons and they weren't willing to learn. Like, I'm, right. I can almost guarantee that none of these police officers, none of these parents, none of these, uh, you know, detectives or whatever – Nobody, I'm sure, had read these books. Right. And it said, uh, Patricia Pulling, uh, some guy wrote like an essay about D&D, &D, and she just pretty much used that mm. as fact, but then even changed his essay to fit her narrative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, was, it seemed like a lot of uh, taking what somebody said, and it's like a big game of telephone. Right. Where everybody just gets it a little bit more wrong where, oh, this, this kid wasn't doing so well in school. He was a little troubled. Uh, he, he did have fun playing Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, this troubled kid played Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, this kid who killed himself played Dungeons and Dragons. Right. Like, it's just a, seemed like a big game of an echo chamber telephone type situation. Yeah, but then like um, the Association of Suicidology. Oh, that sounds crazy. Yeah. They came out and said there's no causal link between uh, like D and D and suicide any more than there's a link between breathing and suicide, mm -hmm. and that they also said to suggest a game could push them over the edge is a is cruel and unfeeling that these kids had depression or had issues, and then just to think that a game is what 
kicked him over the edge. Yeah. Is kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like playing down the kid or making the kid sound like he can't control what's real and what's not. Mm-hmm. And uh, it it's definitely, there's definitely a lot of, well, I mean, satanic panic. Uh, you have Christians, obviously, uh, gaslighting that. And the fact that, well, I mean, I know Christian people now who won't watch Harry Potter, you know, because uh, it has to do with magic. Yeah, and, and, and magic is the work of the devil. So my relatives are Christian, like my grandma and my aunt. But they at least would understand. I mean, they were like, they got... My aunt one time took uh, the liner notes for the Ninja Turtle soundtrack, yeah. and then the theme song, the tur- Turtle Power. Yeah, she was like, "It keeps saying power and power. It just says power." And I'm like, "It's just a song." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, and I think, I mean, if if you are um, an adult and you think magic is evil but you have a cell phone in your pocket like i think i think electric electricity is i think in a way an unexplainable power in our society yeah well i think uh what i heard is um a lot of the religious people were kind of not to downplay religion but they're like okay your fantasy is starting to surplant our fantasy yeah so therefore your fantasy is bad ours is the real mm. one and so they felt kind of threatened yeah i could see that and um well and it's it's funny because i had heard gary gygax was a christian yeah and it people just can't separate the two right and they said uh oh a lot of the spells were based on witchcraft and he's like no it's actually from this book by james so-and-so um and he kind of used his like fantasy mechanics for mm-hmm. uh the spells and stuff. Yeah, I had heard J.R.R. Tolkien was a Christian and he has a a big fantasy series. Yeah, yeah, his um best friend was Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll's a huge Christian. He's the Lion the Witch in the Wardrobe guy. Yeah, yeah. Which that is a little bit more explainable because I think all the good people don't use magic and the witch is the bad person, but I mean there's Matt the the lion's magic. Okay. I mean, it's kind of a Christian allegory. Yeah. But it's all fantasy. Yeah, it, yeah, it's fantasy. Yeah. It's it, that's what it is. It's it was all a fantasy. One of the uh, effects that they didn't intend by all this was that um D&D players and these role-playing groups actually became tighter. Yeah. Because their hobby was coming under attack. Yeah. So then they actually fought back and that actually boosted the sales of these uh, core rule books because a lot of teenagers were like interested wanted to know what it was all about was it as, as satanic as they said and, yeah i mean could you imagine being some kid who listens to rock and roll music and then all of a sudden you're seeing on tv that you can worship the devil through fantasy gaming yeah or it's gonna learn how to cast spells like oh, i gotta get this book and see what it's about yeah and then you actually like oh this is fun <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, not, right yeah there's no real witchcraft but it's a cool game yeah I I had this idea for a long time ago, and I'm glad that uh, that we finally got to do it. Yeah, and, and I hope we did it justice. You know, uh, with with a little bit of it. If you if you guys out there in listener land uh, have any interesting stories of of playing Dungeons and Dragons or uh, or any other uh, questions or ideas, uh, make sure you leave them in the comments or yeah. or uh, let us know. We, yeah, go to that uh, Facebook page and strike up a conversation yeah search on facebook blue ribbon lounge podcast yeah and uh remember if a bear steals your shoes make sure you email the podcast at uh, blue ribbon lounge moline at gmail.com or if um aliens abduct you yeah check out uh blue ribbon lounge.com uh to check out uh any information on that or if you're lost in downtown downport Check out Blue Ribbon Lounge stickers. Uh, they're posted all over the place. Yeah, they'll lead you to uh, Abernathy's. Yeah, Abernathy's. Uh, shopabernathy's.com to pick up your Blue Ribbon Lounge uh, podcast merch. And we're coming out with new stickers soon. So we'll, we'll post about that in the Facebook page. All right. We'll see you later. Yeah, see you guys. Be good to yourselves. There you go.
have it. A frightening look into America's most frightening pastime. Remember that it's not your children's fault that they're being drawn into a satanic world of nightmare. It's their gym teacher's fault for making them feel outcast when they couldn't do one single pull-up.